Thank you very much. Well, sit down. You mind this jaron outfit? I know, yes. Can I put my little paper collar on you? You sure can. And then if you don't get it all, I you call on us. Yes. Uh, well, you have uh, spent perhaps more time than any previous American president with our queen. And I was wondering what interested you most about her. Oh, well, uh, there was no surprise, first of all. Uh, Nancy had, as you know, uh, been in the presence a, a great deal when she was there for the wedding. And then her gracious invitation to us at Windsor a ride together and all, there, so it wasn't any surprise that it was only just reinforced and strengthened as to what a uh, truly fine, gracious lady she is. But uh, uh, I think so uh, unlike what most people would have of the concept of, of royalty, but uh, he's a delightful person. If I may switch uh, to a uh different subject, uh, your Orlando speech. In your Orlando speech, you uh, talked about the confrontation of the United States and the Soviet Union as a confrontation of good and evil and darkness and light. And that gave the impression, at least, that there is really no logical conclusion except war and that a reconciliation would be very difficult between the two parties. And uh, I'm just wondering how you reconcile that outlook with your aims for peace. Well, Henry, I don't think that those of me who were there and heard the entire speech uh, would take it that way. I think it is somehow lifting that out in context of this line and this description as the focus of evil and so forth. Certainly, their entire beliefs, uh, beginning with the disbelief in God, uh, their entire beliefs are so contrary to what we accept as morality. Uh, just witness a camp of Chia in Afghanistan and so forth. But no, what I was pointing out there, and I still believe is uh, time tested and proven, is not the inevitability of war, but a recognition and a willingness to face up to what these differences are in our views and between us, to be realistic about it. But let me just point out a couple of things. Uh, we've seen, under the guise of diplomacy and detente and so forth in the past, uh, efforts to kind of sweep the differences under the rug and pretend they don't exist. Uh, I have stated very frankly what I believe the differences are, but at the same time, I have expressed my determination and my belief that peace is achievable. Uh, I'm very concerned with those people who uh, somehow seem to think they just, without their realizing they're thinking, that they're, they're building in their mind a kind of war is inevitable. Uh, I can't subscribe to that at all, but look at the proof. The START negotiations, they have already come down to a lower figure for weapons than was supposed to be the great triumph in Salt II. Several hundred, they've agreed to less than the Salt II Treaty. In the INF, they came immediately to the table, no objecting, no protesting to negotiate, and while their offer was not acceptable because of some other terms, from some 350 odd SS-20 missiles, they made a proposal that brought them down to 162. Uh, so I, th I think that uh, this, this just proves that uh, maybe being willing, frankly, to recognize the differences between us and uh, uh, what our view is uh, uh, has proven that it's successful. Talking about missiles, uh, the, Europe, the number of European leaders from Mrs. Thatcher to Chancellor Cohen, have been trying to persuade you to uh, put forward a new initiative of uh, an interim solution, with still with the zero option as the ultimate goal, but uh, come forward with an interim solution. I gather that you are 
very seriously considering such a move? Well, let me say that, Henry, this is a difficult thing to, to answer, and I'm sure they know this also, because we do stay in constant consultation, and we aren't going to do anything without continuing consultation with them, and I must say they have all expressed great appreciation for the fact that unlike some previous times when we acted unilaterally that uh, we do recognize our responsibility as allies. Um, the difficulty in answering is when you're at a negotiating table, and off and on I spent about 25 years in labor management relations at a negotiating table, you can't talk openly about your strategy or what you're going to do. But I can only point to this fact that that from the very beginning, when I announced the uh, total elimination, the zero option, I said at the same time, we will negotiate in good faith any legitimate or reasonable proposal. Um, and that remains true today. Uh, but to, to get into a discussion of uh, where you're going or what you're going to do, uh, that just is bad negotiating strategy. Yeah, but haven't these European leaders already more or less laid their cards on the table? Except that all of them are still openly supportive of our deployment of missiles, uh, our own missiles there, as was originally decided oh. in 1979. Uh, so that's a little different than um, uh, advocating a, a, a position and wanting an open agreement. If you ever did such a thing, that then becomes the beginning point for negotiation. Uh, our beginning point for negotiation was <laughs> total elimination. Well, I understand that there are two views, more or less two views in the administration. One that feels that uh, you should wait until the missiles are beginning to be put in place in Europe, because then the Soviet Union will be under pressure to make concessions, or uh, that you should come forward with your own initiative, take the lead, and uh, come forward with uh, something that proposes equality, but is uh, something less than zero, zero option. Well, again, as I say, I, I mean, I don't. Sorry. I mean, I don't think that there are any divisions in the sense of splits here and one faction against another faction on this. Obviously, in discussing all the ramifications, there are going to be people with different ideas than others, and a variety of viewpoints of as to timing or numbers or things of that kind. There is one thing in which we're total agreement on, and that is um, that the ultimate goal should continue to be the zero base, the elimination of that whole class of weapons. For the sake of the world, if nothing else, we're also in agreement on the fact that um, uh, there must be no change in our plan to, uh, to begin deployment on schedule. But uh, can you tell me in which direction you lean, for instance? Because <laughs> the, uh, the Dutch foreign minister, for example, Dutch the uh, Prime Minister who saw you the other day made some, uh, after he had left you, uh, indicated that you are going to come forward with a new initiative. Well, you know, what I said then and what I have just said here is um, we have announced our ultimate goal and we will, as I said from the very first, we are ready to negotiate in good faith uh, any reasonable uh, proposal suggestion on the way to uh, to the ultimate goal. Uh, I understand that uh, you beginning to come under pressure to, I'm now talking about US-Argentine relations, to give the kind of uh, certification that would be necessary for the United States to sell arms to the Argentine again? I haven't, uh, I, no proposal or no discussion has been held with me at all on 
any such subject. We're watching, uh, of course, very closely, and from the very first, as we've always hoped, we hope that the uh, that there will be a peaceful resolution of of that problem. What would you advise now in terms of the next step? <laughs> <laughs> well, I I think that would be a little presumptuous. I think this is. Uh, as a result of the action taken there, this is something to be determined between the United Kingdom and, and Argentina. But you're not planning to play the role of the mediator as you did during the, during the war? Only to the extent that someone would ask our help if we could be helpful. We'd be pleased to, any time that if we might lend aid to bring about peace. You've now uh, had talks with King Hussein, with the Foreign Minister of Israel and uh, Lebanon. I wonder how do you foresee now the situation developing? In, do you foresee that uh, negotiations on your own plan will perhaps begin soon? Or uh, Well, I'm very hopeful. There are, uh, I think that we have made some progress toward the, the first step that we believe is absolutely necessary getting into that, and that is the uh, withdrawal of all the foreign forces, the PLO, the Syrians, and the Israelis from Lebanon, and give the new government of Lebanon a chance to establish its own sovereignty and heal the wounds that have been opened there for so long, and the factionalism and so forth. Um, I think that is that's absolutely vital. In we want to cooperate in any way we can uh, to help bring that about. As I say, we've, the Foreign Minister Shamir has been here, and uh, then the Foreign Minister of uh, Lebanon, Salem, and uh, the really senior statesman, the elder statesman there, Salam, the former Prime Minister. Uh, and we continue, uh, Phil Habib is going back now again, we continue to try and help them work toward an elimination of uh, the differences, and the differences have grown less. So as I say, we're optimistic. And then I, I believe that once that's accomplished, that Hussein will uh, offer himself as the negotiator to then continue the peace negotiations involving all the other Middle East problems. After the Lebanese situation yes. is resolved. And, uh, in, uh, you know, there are a, a lot of Middle Eastern experts, so, so called, uh, who believe that uh, unless you put certain pressures on Israel, it, there will be no moratorium on the building of, uh, of uh, settlements in the West Bank. How do you feel about that? Well, the West Bank, there, there certainly is no illegality to the building that based on the Camp David Agreement and the period of, of, um, of discussion that was supposed to then take place uh, with no one having uh, a claim for or against doing such things. Uh, this of course would be where the negotiations then would begin to the real peace negotiations uh, with presumably King Hussein involved in those negotiations. And I think, as I've said before, that what, we're really, what really has to be resolved is the, an arrangement involving on one side uh, land, territory, and on the other, the need for security. And this is what has to be worked out, that one can finally, Israel uh, uh, have the security that they don't have to remain a an armed camp at the great expense that it has been to their economy. And uh, this is going to take compromise with regard to territory uh, on the other side. And a resolution of the Palestinian problem, which you've got a great many human beings there that you just can't uh, pretend they don't exist. I mean, do you think that uh, in spite of what uh, Prime Minister Begin has said in public, that, as you say, a compromise is possible without you exerting sufficient pressure? Well, that's, that's where, that's the reason for the negotiations. 
And again, just as I was talking about our own negotiations with regard to arms, um, negotiations sometimes in labor management may describe it. They've, they've been uh, presented as one side asks for the moon and the other side offers green cheese and they then talk their way to a point someplace between those two extremes and settle it. Mr. President, uh, I, uh, I know you're not talking about uh, your future plans, but if you decided to run for another term, what would be your objectives that you feel you haven't been able to achieve in the first four years for the next oh. round? I think we have a long way to go in two major departments. Uh, one of them, the restoration of our ability to uh, to be secure uh, nationally, in the field of national defense and so forth. Uh, and the other, however, is the economic situation. Now, so far, we haven't begun to get all that we asked for in our plan. But I think that now, after all of the criticism and all of the sniping and all of the sneering at what they call Reaganomics, uh, there is so much evidence that the plan, even partially employed, was successful that I'm beginning to wonder if uh, uh, they won't decide to look for another name rather than Reaganomics and know that it's going to be a successful plan and not a failure. But the uh, that the the economy and looking ahead for the, the balance of this decade to get back to a balanced budget. Uh, and I would still like to see that uh, then affirmed in the Constitution so that we can never again go down that road uh, that we have in these last few decades, that we could begin paying back on the national debt, reducing that. When you stop to think that the interest alone on our national debt is greater than the total cost of the United States government not too many years ago. Um, the, to do that and to recognize that there is a certain level as to the percentage of gross national product that government takes for itself and takes from the people in taxes, that uh, if you go beyond that level, you then do disrupt the economy cause the kind of problems that we've had. To eliminate totally inflation, the world has been going through the longest sustained period of inflation in the history of mankind. And this recession is worldwide. And that is a great danger. This country can actually affect the economy worldwide. And I think our conquering so far, not completely conquered, let us say, our winning over inflation so far, to take it down from double digits from 12.4 and sometimes reaching as high as 13, 14, to where for the last six months it's only been running 1.4 percent. But the job isn't going to be finished for a while. As you look at the projections out through the years, uh, this there is a lot yet to be done, but we, we have embarked on a different course. I can remember when the people on our side, the Republicans, uh, and you realize I'm talking uh, the party, not personal, over these years, what needs to be done. Uh, the Republican Party and the Democratic Party, the debate they engaged in was kind of a rear guard action on the part of the Republicans against the ever increasing desire of government to spend, to intervene in the marketplace, to become even more powerful and, and thus eventually oppressive on the people. Uh, much of what you've seen happen in your own country. Um, the debate today in government is not that debate anymore of the trying to hold back on that increase. The debate is both sides agreeing to uh, reduced spending and reduced government, and the argument is only about how much to reduce it. And I think that's quite a triumph. I wondered, uh, because of the, 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 the decline in the oil price, uh, that will be, it'll benefit the majority of countries in the world, 
but it will be to the detriment of uh, two or three uh, countries like Mexico and Nigeria. I wonder whether you've at all considered the possibility of uh, taking the advantages that the majority of the countries have, have, uh, been, have accrued to them could be used to, to, to uh, sustain and help the, the countries that are suffering from, from the decline of the oil price. Well, we have been of help, and we have been with our contributions to the international uh, banks, the, uh, those funding agencies, but also in direct help. For example, as I told our friends and allies in the summit meeting in Versailles, uh, in the discussion of the third world, and, what, and our view is that you help them develop their own economies, not constantly be mendicants with their hands out, uh, waiting for, uh, for someone to give them something. We, every year, buy more of the uh, production of those countries than all the rest of the world put together. And we think that, uh, that this is a way to go. We think also that if we are able to alter the economic situation, that some of those same countries have the highest rates of inflation in the world. And thus, even though it's going to be, there's going to be a temporary readjustment of those reduced revenues. But if, on the other hand, for the whole world economic picture, they see their own costs going down, uh, this will be, uh, will serve to, to uh, make that adjustment for them, and they too will will wind up better off. But uh, no, we're not going to retreat uh, from the help that we've been able to give, and as we resolve some of our own problems, we're able to help more. Do you think there is the need for uh, reviewing the possibility of an international monetary, a new international monetary system? I can't say that I have a hard and fast view on that. I think it is something uh, uh, for all of us to look at. Maybe that would be one of the subjects of discussion in the Williamsburg Summit this spring. But do you think that uh, the world situation makes such a, such a revival of some new system uh, desirable? I, can only, I can't go that far. I can only say that I think we need to look at it. I don't believe that that, the monetary system has been the, uh, the disruptive factor in bringing on this economic recession we've been in. I think inflation is what led to the high interest rates. The lender has to get back uh, when the loan is repaid. He has to have gotten back in interest all the depreciated value of the money that he loaned that is going to be repaid back, or paid back in inflation, in, in money of lesser value than what he, when he had loaned it. And so up go the interest rates. I think right now uh, they're higher than they need to be, the real interest rates. I think what we're seeing, because of our own rate of inflation, they should be much lower. But I think what we're seeing is timidity. They're not quite sure yet that we're going to stay the course and that uh, this is going to continue. They've been through well, in our own country, seven recessions, I guess this one's eight, uh, since World War II. And every one of them, uh, as they came out, resulted in higher inflation, and uh, each time higher than the last, so that we've been on an ever-increasing uh, scale that way. I think that, uh, that there is beginning to be this confidence that this time the recovery that we're uh, bringing about is based on sound economic policies and not artificial stimulants. When they're aware of that, I think we'll see further reductions in the interest rates, and as a result of that, we'll see further prosperity. You, uh, in, after three and a half years in office, you look as younger than perhaps than you uh, <laughs> enter. And I was wondering, what is the secret of your pacing yourself? 
Well, um, for one thing, I, I recognize that it would be awfully easy. I've always been uh, an outdoorsman, to use that expression. I'm always uh, uh, living in California, been able to get to our ranch, ride a lot, and so forth. But it would be very easy here to sit at that desk and uh, you go home in an elevator <laughs> at the end of the day and go back to work in an elevator. Uh, it's very difficult to get outside at all. It would be very easy to let that become uh, your lifestyle. But uh, fortunately, uh, we resisted and we have a little gymnasium upstairs there. And I have a daily routine that would work out at the end of every day. And frankly, uh, I have to say physically, I think I feel better than I did a couple of decades ago. Marvelous. Uh, do you feel, I mean, as you just described it a little now, <clears throat> you feel a bit insulated here in the White House? Uh, not as much as, as people think. You, you're insulated in the sense that uh, if you decide to uh, leave the grounds, uh, you're a, a group, <laughs> quite a group. Uh, you can't just go out and walk down the street and drop in at a drugstore for a bottle of aspirin or something. But on the other hand, you have much more contact with people than, than anyone is kind to believe. First of all, uh, you're surrounded not just by senior staff, but by an awful lot of people who are working here in different capacities, and you get to know, and you know about their families and their problems and so forth. But also, the the effort that I make to get out, uh, when you're, uh, when you go out on, say, a speaking engagement or something like the Orlando uh, trip that you you mentioned, uh, you have a contact with people. I stay in touch with all the people that I knew, and having a ranch is another way because uh, there's a whole circle of acquaintances and uh, people and uh, workmen and so forth that. Uh, how many telephone calls do you take a day? Well, uh, I'm available. I, uh, maybe I make more than I, I take. Yes. And uh, that is another thing. Uh, people that I've known back over the years and former schoolmates and so forth, uh, I stay in touch with both by correspondence and the other. And then I've done something that I did when I was governor. I realize I can't read all my mail, uh, several hundred thousand letters a month. But I instructed there and I've instructed here. And a very wonderful lady there in charge of that mail department uh, does a good job of knowing the kind of mail that I want to see. And not just the friendly letters, <laughs> the ones that have got a challenge in them and so forth. Uh, letters from young people and so forth and constantly sends me uh, a representative sampling of the mail. And not only for me to read, but uh, usually the letters she's been, I answer myself. So uh, I don't feel out of touch. Do you uh, foresee a meeting with uh, Mr. Andropov sometime this year? Or? Uh, Yes, I can, I can see that. Uh, I think uh, what I would resist is um, a kind of a get acquainted meeting just to have a meeting. Because I think such a meeting raises people's expectations so high that then to just be able to say, well, we got acquainted and said hello uh, and not have any result. But we are in touch constantly. We're not out of touch with the Soviet government. and. Uh, we are seeking areas where we can put together a meeting in which uh, could be beneficial to both sides. But you're not making any preconditions. What you want really is just preparation, is it? That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, one, no, you never have such a meeting with a precondition on what's going to result. You can have determined in advance the subjects that you think should be discussed between you think it'll be in, in, in the fall or? Uh, 
I can't honestly say whether it be this year or next. Uh, I, I know that there are no, uh, no plans uh, immediately or in the near future for one. But uh, I, would, I would expect that there would be such a meeting uh, uh, before the first term is out. Much success for the rest. Well, and thank you very much. I hope you will decide to stay on. <laughs> I can't answer that. <laughs> <laughs> I know, you don't. <laughs> well, it's good to see you. Thank you very much. <laughs>